okay? Exchange theory. Look, it's, it's exchange theory according to Bowles, the person who wrote the textbook, so it's a little hard to say that that's really exchange theory. It's like the Edric box and then the social planet. All right. You, Bowles is a funny man. He's a post-Marxist, um, the person who set your beta textbook. Um, have, you got it? have you actually seen the text that you're working from? Yeah. Um, he's a post-Marxist uh, and one of the very few left post left, one of the very few remaining post-Marxists. Um, and his interpretation of what is um, useful to study at the, this level is quite different from te other textbooks. Um, not to say it's wrong, it's just an interesting perspective. Anyway, it's 10 o'clock, let's begin. Welcome to History of Economic Thought. We're going to move the next five lectures from these idea of margins to modernism. So we're going to be tracing a period. Uh, by the way, you can tell your peers that the power mic isn't working, so lecture videos aren't going online until such a stage as they are working, but there's that one and that one. Uh, mics on the ceilings, which should be catching my and any other lecturer's voices until the lapel mic's fixed. I can't do anything about that. All right, but we're going to be moving from margins to modernism and tracking over quite a long period, but you'll see that things work a little differently now. We're not going to be moving through tracks of information, uh, Marx's five volumes on capital, uh, Adam Smith's multiple books. Instead, you need to start to consider this that problems in economics are starting to become quite difficult. And in the same way that nowadays we need, would need teams to collaborate and solve problems, so the individual contributions of each of these people become smaller and smaller. So we are going to meet multiple people along these five journey lectures. Why are we meeting so many people as opposed to not wanting to uh, just talk about the theory in general? Well, this comes in a pedagogical choice. It has to do with the idea that should I teach you something that I think is valuable and that you will find valuable, we need to meet the people so that you can find the material in its original. Why has this been very useful? Well, throughout this section, the next five lectures, we're going to be trying to cover some controversies, innovations, um, and thoughts which economics has tended to forgotten. It's not taught in mainstream UCT. And we're going to see why learning history of economic thought could be to students, to lecturers, a very valuable insight into not reinventing the wheel. We're also going to work out why sometimes things took so long. For instance, hopefully by now you would have noted that not even in this lecture will we meet the demand and the supply curve. And this lecture starts at about 1820. And the thing is, is that these things that we take for granted, modern economics, have some historical downfalls that are implicit in the assumptions of what these people had written. These assumptions have been mainly forgotten, as it tends to always be the first thing you forget about learning any new model. I mean, your own experiences as students would indicate to me that you wouldn't remember the assumptions over what the model is telling you, would you? So. The assumptions get lost in the primary texts, and as we move further and further, so it becomes more and more difficult to get back to it. The purpose of this is to try and realign you with who came up with these thoughts, and how did each of these thoughts arise in an ever-changing world. So this lecture we're going to move from utility to a concept that we wouldn't have yet seen, but it's very easy to understand, and that's Wicksteed's explanation of the Euler theorem. During this, during this lecture, we're going to be discussing things like uh, utility, which is a value theory, which we will later define, as well as the production function. So these are going to come about. But first, let's talk a little bit about what is happening in our world. The world, we could say, is centered around 1850. And in this world, we need to still remember the limitations of our own communication. This is a world of independent rediscovery. Different languages create massive barriers. Some of these texts in the original have only been translated as late as the 1950s. That's 100 years after. 
We're going to see some tragic stories about people who've came up with theories but were completely forgotten, sometimes in the, even in their own country. Those who came up with conflicting theories and those who, um, well, they pretty much co-discovered the same concept or others who partially discovered it. Whichever way, we're going to try and start designing this idea that there can be convergence and, in, and convergence on the same school of thought and we're going to demonstrate this throughout. But there are some changing forces which exist. We are going to start in this lecture moving out of the classical era. Now, remember that last in our workshops we talked about political economy. Political economy is this mesh of ideology as well as with theory. Professionalization of economics as a study brought about a change. It separated these ideas of ideology and theory. Historically, in 1885, we see the first real emergence of what we can expect economics these days to travel in. There comes the Quarterly Journal of Economics. which is a British publication, and also the American Society of Economics. But our story starts even more prior to this. Who of our previous studied economists would you say would have been a professor of economics? Well, it's no trick question. We've so far seen Marx, who is not associated with any institution, Adam Smith, who was a philosopher, but the only person who formally held the title of Professor of Economics prior to the period that we are now about to investigate was Malthus. And even with Malthus, you have to consider how much his writing was still on political economy. We're now going to move into a world of mathematics and envy of the natural sciences. Now, what do, what do I mean by this envy of the natural science? Well, there became a big occurrence around the period 1850, 1860, running to about 1900, of this envy of firstly physics. Economics was, was, uh, was, was envious of physics, but physics was very envious of mathematics. The calculus, calculus as we understand it, um, was invented around 1680. And it was a bickering fight between Leibniz and Newton. Leibniz, who um, died in 1717, and Newton, who died in 1727. But so far, we've traced our journey without seeing the use of a single derivative function. And this is important because it came into the head of certain economists that we're going to discuss that they wanted to be the Newtons and the Copernicus, which is an astronomer who discovered how planets revolve, of economics. They wanted to take this and formalize it. But most interestingly, our changes are now driven by something which, is, which, is, which we begin, a thought experiment. And this thought experiment occurs with regards to value. So, this concept of value is the first time, Sorry. Is the first time that we start considering how marginalism came about. But it's important first to understand from where we start. Let's take, for instance, the sunflower. This is an amateur child's drawing of the sunflower. What did Adam Smith have to say on value? And how would he describe the value of the sunflower? <coughs> In your previous readings, 
meetings with Adam Smith, what did he have to say about value? Firstly, maybe it's... Okay, let's go. Before now, before this lecture, all the economists that we had met, this is important, had an objective theory of value. What does objective mean? Neutral is, is not unfortunately good enough in this situation. Objective must mean that, yes, it's neutral in terms of it's not personally related, but that each and every, no matter where it occurs, the same thought process would derive to the same uh, result, as opposed to, I like black chairs, because you know that's the color of chairs I like, compared to maybe one of you students who prefer blue chairs. That's a subjective choice. But if it, was, if it is an objective fact that um, we all prefer five things as opposed to four things, well, that's objective. Five is greater than four. And it must always be true no matter what. <coughs> Adam Smith <coughs> expounds his theory of value, which is... You can judge the importance of the material from what was written on the board, which is related to scarcity. Now, we're going to encounter throughout this the value debate. The value debate was why is air cheap? And diamond expense. It was a question Adam Smith himself posed. It is a question he sought to try and answer. It's a question that Mill worked on. It's a question Ricardo worked on. But it's a tricky question and there's lots written on it. So we're going to use the sunflower example to simplify the discussion a little bit. For Adam Smith, A was cheap because it was plentiful. <coughs> While diamonds were rare. And therefore expensive. The value of an object was objectively defined. Scarcity, which is an objective. We could all make an objective assumption as to whether something's rare or not rare. And that influenced the value. Now, here's a problem with Adam Smith's theory. We have a child's painting of a sunflower. A one-of-a-kind child's painting of a sunflower. <laughs> According to Adam Smith's logic, you would agree naively that this must be a scarce and expensive resource. These are the same problems that Adam Smith's discussion of air is cheap, diamonds are expensive run into. All of these counterexamples. What about Marx? <clears throat> Here is, is Van Gogh's flowers, but it's a forgery. Now Marx, Marx had an objective theory of value too. What was Marx's objective theory, theory of value? Where did value arise from? Labor. Labor. Indeed. Now, I think you would agree with me that this is a skilled forgery. The hours, time, money, you know, the hours put into this, the labor put into this, would mean that it is labourly expensive, it's, exp you know, it's going to be expensive, right? Now, what do we know about forgeries? Are they, in fact, expensive? No. Forgeries are valueless. They are not what it is, yes. Well, wouldn't Marx have said that we're wrong in doing wouldn't he have said that? Whether he, whether he said that we are morally wrong or not, his, his value must be is an objective theory. It's based on labor. And the theory has a shortcoming. Here it is. I produced a forgery. Labor went into the forgery. Right or wrong, this must be valuable, but it is not. You can't disagree. Well, but wouldn't he say that it should be valuable in his society? Because he uses the so he says that we're wrong in saying that it's not that. So, so your like, contradiction that you're creating is not going on the same premises that he's going. Right. 
before, perhaps Marx could argue that less labor went into creating the forgery than went into creating the original, so that the original was worth more. But does that mean, but is the forgery worth something? He might argue that it is still worth something. Well, this is the point I'm making. It's believable. It's believable that his argument is that there is exists labor time. There does exist. A forgery, we know, is valueless. I'm talking about the zero value that this forgery holds on the market in comparison to what Marx proposed. There cannot be, no matter what you try to say, you can't get from zero value to some value if the minute that there's one labor minute applied to this piece of work. Uh-oh. So these are unsatisfi unsatisfactory explanations. They also run into other problems. Have you ever tried to read Marx on the value of A? It's a tricky one. These are things that you can explore, and perhaps I can try and include them in your readings if you would find that interesting, <clears throat> these points. There are also un other unsatisfactory explanations which I'm just going to touch on, for instance, Ricardo. Ricardo goes about trying to work out the price of skilled labor. And he says that, well, skilled labor are, uh, are um, much more efficient than unskilled labor. Therefore, there should be a factor cost of what skilled labor is. So let's say that skilled labor is twice as efficient. <clears throat> now, the problem with this is that we can isolate these things for one, two, three people, but remember we're talking now about market. Ricardo's theory on skilled labor falls into a very interesting critique in that it has problems of circularity. This, the factor of which unskilled labor is more skilled than skilled labor is determined by the market. That's what Ricardo relies on. But the market determines the price, which also then determines the factor. And these are starting to become the problems that piles of paper are spent by classical economists trying to explain value. Suddenly we have a shift of thought. We read, meet the real sunflower, and to the utilitarian, we have the first suitable explanation. Yes, sir. Could you just go over that Ricardo, the circular thing one more time? Sorry. All right. So <clears throat> the, the markets has to set the price. Maybe we're talking aggregated skilled units here, not just one. I can't necessarily say that you're more efficient than me. We have to try and get an aggregate function over all skilled labor, because we're trying to say an aggregate pricing. The market has to set the price. But then, if the market's setting the price, the factor is dependent on the market. It's not independent, it's endogenous in the market, which means that we can't get isolation. We can't say objectively skilled labor is 2.2 times as powerful as unskilled labor. So, we, so these problems persist, and we meet the utilitarian point of view. Today, we're going to move through these schools. <clears throat> we're going to concentrate on post school thought. We're going to look at Jevons, Edgeworth, Wigsby. You would have seen Edgeworth, Edgeworth Box. Jevons, very interesting. Walrus, general equilibrium. Pareto, Pareto optimality, although we won't discuss that. And tomorrow we're going to meet the Austrian school. Again, they are in columns for a reason. They are independently happening often. Unless I'm going to tell you otherwise, thoughts are not necessarily flowing between these schools. They are translation problems that occur. Let's look at Jevons. Now, I'm going to tell you a lot more about Jevons than what's on the slide. Again, use the board for what's interesting. Um, the slide is there as a minimum to know level. <coughs> so Jevons, brief history, started life from an affluent family, but his merchant father didn't do so well for himself, got turned in, uh, spent a few years at university, but had to be recalled um, because they couldn't afford the education. Ended up in Sydney, 
and had his first experiences working on the coal problem, the price of coal. Now, coal is, again, one of these lovely examples of goods that should be relatively the same price because it's a commodity. Again, it has, you know, it has, a, it has a fixed percentage of coal factor, etc. So you should be able to price coal very easily. But he works on coal for a while in Sydney. He then works at the Sydney Mint. He works on the Sydney Mint. He's interested in things like index values, and he does some empirical work. If you're looking for, uh, in your honors project, stuff related to pricing of commodity goods like coal, very good person to read in the original. Lots of hints been offered. <clears throat> Index values, and he ends up later in London. He is uh, the first professional economist that we're going to look at today. This is not his part-time hobby, his interest while he busy expropriates other things. He doesn't lecture anything else. He is an economist, as we know it. And he has Newtonian aspirations. He wants to be one, somebody who transforms economics in the same way that Newton did. Now, this is a little tricky, considering his training in calculus is a little poor. But he has another great influencer, and that's Bentham. Now, it's important to note that this idea of, of subjective, which we're about to get to, is not a new one. Jevons cottons onto the subjective theory of value. Now, that immediately means we have a transition away from objective. It can be independent for every person. There were people expostulating subjectivity a while ago. Bentham, William Sinow, Walrus or so, but previously people who you have met include Say and Kaliak. You know Say, Say's law. Yes, okay. He was an expostulator of the subjective theory of value. But it never made it into mainstream, in part because it requires the development of this idea of thinking at the margin. Now, what does it mean? Well, he starts his book, Devons, with a very simple diagram. It looks like this. And he says, the amount of pleasure I get from the first good is a lot. A little bit less for the second, a little bit less for this, a little bit less for this, a little bit less for this. This is not objective, it, it changes. The amount of pleasure I get changes. <clears throat> he then makes his first, the first real move and says, well, under certain circumstances, which if you would like a reading on, I can give you, we can approximate this with a curve. And this is an, insp is an inspiration. <coughs> because it begins to allow one to consider here the marginal pleasure in the changes of each goods. And here, the continuous function allows us to take the derivative. Jevons has for the first time formalized what marginal utility is. Jevons calls this not marginal utility, but final utility. when you're reading his text. I have included in, in the reader already a lovely little extract about where Jevons says the source of value is, which we're going to move on to in the next slide. The thing is, is that Jevons formulates this with derivatives in a mathematical setting and is a satisfactory explanation that answers the air is cheap, the diamonds is expensive problem. How does it satisfy this problem? How does value arise from a, from a marginal setting? This is pure, pure micro. 
should be comfortable here, but we can recap. Yes? Well, we consume a lot of air every day, so the marginal value of air increases. The marginal value of the next breath of air is very small. You only have one diamond, the marginal value of the diamond is very high. We are thinking at the margin. The value is derived from the addition of each good. It incorporates somehow this idea of scarcity with, and you'll see shortly, an implicit idea of labor, at least by Jevons. Now, Jevons goes on in his book to uh, show how exchanges happen using calculus and using, um, using very basic two people explanations. I'm going to give you a reading on this because to try and show, to, which is not important for the sake of history of economic thought, but very interesting to see. But there is an important footnote. Jevons in his, in his first book, which comes out 1871, does not know the existence of Gossen. Gossen is an, a forgotten about German economist who stumbled on this exact theory of value that Jevons did independently about 10 years earlier. But nobody in Germany read Gossen. And Gossen was only translated into English around 1778. 1878. Gossen himself, though, perhaps too proud a man, had the ambition of being Copernicus. Now, Copernicus, he worked out how these, how the world revolved. He was one of the early astronomers, and he said that his work would change economics. Regrettably for him, nobody read it, and it was dead off the press. But it's an example of just how our story begins today with co-discoveries and reinventions because the problems force people to answer. Jevons, though, is only answering a problem with regards to marginal utility <coughs> and value. He's asking, answering utility is apparently linked with value, right? Utility is an inherent concept of value. Utility does not answer any of the problems related to costs. Here is Jevons' explanation for costs. The cost of production determines supply. Supply determines final degree of utility. Final degree, which we can understand as marginal utility, determines value. He has incorporated labor in here some, in, under the cost of production here. <clears throat> so his theory is speaking only about the final good. We haven't seen anything about how marginal production processes happen yet. Let's move a little further. Yes? So why would you say supply in terms of final degree? Consumption would be the utility that I receive, not supply. This is why we study history of economic thoughts. Perhaps the concept, I'm not saying it is or isn't wrong, what you just expostulated, but these are the thoughts of people as they develop the theory. We return to them, this is what he said. Yeah, but uh, so I'm asking, is he saying that, so that the, so in our terms, that supply is creating the washing mm -hmm. Saying cost of production determines supply. The amount that can be produced is determined by all the factor inputs. The amount of supply, the, the supply determines the final utility. Something that is scarce will inhibit a higher marginal cost. Diamonds, air, that sort of thing. Final degree of utility, marginal utility, the diamond air explanation, determines value. <clears throat> now, Jevons made some problems. He, did, he 
in a situation where, considering his assumptions, we ended up with what is, what is a fixed equilibrium point, so to speak. Uh, without having read Jevons, this is a little complicated to explain and not necessary. <laughs> but it's important to know that Edgeworth now comes in. Jevons' explanation is essentially a special case of general equilibrium. It has to do with the fact that in this special case, the indifference curves will always line up. So if we consider our Edgeworth box, If we consider our Edgeworth box, <clears throat> the situation that Jevons was talking about would be would require this way you're absolutely on the contact line and they're both meeting. Edgeworth critiques Jevons, and Edgeworth is a friend of Jevons, and comes about with this more broad concept of what you now know in this region that there can be interaction, the contact curve, and things relating to that. Reading Edgeworth is important because the understanding of how these contact curves work, if you want to research it further, remember this course is to teach you about how history developed, how these tools developed, so that you can find problems in them in your future life as an economist, is important. But Edgeworth was a funny man, just to make sure you haven't lost my sense of humor, nor that anybody else has. Um, Francis Ishtor Edgeworth, uh, has been spoken of by a colleague, Marshall, who we'll meet in two lectures' time. And Marshall used to say, well, Francis is all right to get on with, but beware of Ishtor. Ishtor. His mother was Spanish. Edward also spent mainly the rest of his time looking at econometric work. Now, again, we've done Ed Gibbons and Edgeworth, and we see their contributions to a early sort of general theory. This is not general theory. Edgeworth comes up with the Edgeworth box to satisfy Gibbons' problems. Now the Edgeworth box is entangled in general theory. What is general theory? Well, you know from your advanced macro and micro that this general theory is this idea of utility maximization which can occur over multiple people if there is a Tatamont uh, uh, auctioneer who can announce the prices. And this would ensure maximum utility for everyone. We have to move half across the world to Volras to see this happen. Volus and Jevons were acquaintances. By the time that Volus had, had his idea, completely independently, for general equilibrium, which is a lot more impressive mathematically and in terms of theory than Jevons's contribution, Jevons had already published. He had already made his mark and been the first known economist, besides Gossip, to provide input on utility theory. Wallace, however, was an odd character. His father was an economist. He had a spotted start, denied access to the École Polytechnique in France because some historians accounted to his desire to want to be free world and explore the world, and others to his lack of mathematical ability. <coughs> Whichever way, he never managed to secure a chair in France and ended up in Lausanne which is a French town uh, on, the, on the border, on, to, on Jacques de Deliva. I put this pretty picture here to illustrate that this does not, because it is not generally associated with the powerhouse of economic output. He ended up here not really by, not really by desire. 
his Marxist leanings also excluded him from mainstream thought. He tried life as a journalist but did not succeed. However, he was a co-discoverer of utility theorem and a the discoverer of the general equilibrium. I've included in your text this week, that's for this lecture, a little exposition of general equilibrium from Blau, who's an economic historian. Uh, to read uh, Boris in the original is very heavy going, so I've chosen for a secondary source which will allow you to have the same enjoyment and feeling of discovery that that Walrus had. Now, Walrus is kind of solving a problem, and what has he solved by general equilibrium? This problem of prices and exchange. You know how general equilibrium sets the prices, right? Sets both quantity and price. We've done this in sufficient detail. It's a double solve. It solves two sets of problems, quantity and prices. Jevons' problem was not solving a problem of quantity and prices. It was simply solving a distributional problem, like a barter economy between two people. And that's where it fell over. Vora sets it for N people. But there are certain assumptions, like the tantamount process, um, which run into problems. The reason that there is... uh, this idea of the Walrasian auctioneer comes from Walrus's own experiences, having grown up in France and having, um, in the zone, gone to the fish market every day and seen the fish being auctioned at the fish market. And this idea of markets being set by prices was generalized in his setting. The amount of economic history written on Jevons Edgeworth and Walrus individually full, full books, but this is enough detail to, to allow you to further, to further read into what you want to read and to know where you're looking. We now look at our third English econ- economist for today, Wigstein. And because the flavor of today is utility, and utility explains value, we're now going to answer a different sort of problem. We've seen Jevons' answer to how uh, costs link into, into, uti- into the value of an object, right? We've seen Walrus, he just ignored how costs were working. His theory was set into determining quantity and prices of demands and maximizing the utility of people. Completely independent. Wigstein occurs a little later. <clears throat> he also dies a little later. Wigstein, uh, had a training in the classics, and that's the English classics, and he took on life in, in his early part of his life as a religious minister, but uh, later became a minister of parliament himself. So a total swing. He advocated for things like land tax socialism. And it's interesting to note that both Wigstein and Varas, and I made this, want to make this explicitly clear, had socialist and Marxist leanings. Yet Walrus and the general equilibrium is now used as the cornerstone of neoclassical economics to prove market efficiency. Do you see why it's important to know the context in which these people are writing? Wigstein again set about solving these sort of problems. We've had value answered from a utility perspective. But now, what about this cost problem? Well, <clears throat> land tax socialism we can't cover in front and unfortunately in that detail. But we can certainly and must speak about <coughs> the following. Wigstein comes up with this idea of a production function in a very generalized form. <clears throat> but he has some limited training in classical calculus. Now, in economics, uh, if you've experienced this already, you'll definitely meet it in honors, in mathematics, you would have met it already in differential calculus or any second year level calculus. Uh, we speak about things of the um, of 
the complete derivative. First of all, it is important to, to denote this idea of uh, homogeneous. Does this make sense, or do you want me to explain this? What you're reading here. Hello, anyone? Because I will explain. There can't be someone left here. This is an important critique. Yes, you are. Okay, good. <clears throat> Consider the function like the following. F equals 2y. Okay. A function is homogeneous. If you take a, a factor, we're going to take any factor, t. This is our t factor. We say t of f. t of f, we know, is 2y, right? 2y, t, correct? That is a homogeneous function. As opposed to a function, f equals 2y squared. We take the factor t, we times f by t. Hmm? No, hold on, there's a problem here. Uh, f of y. The t comes in here. Do you see that? In here, f of t, y, well, according to this function, it would be 2 t, y, squared, 2 t squared, y squared. A non-homogeneous function. This is what we're saying. In this case, t is the factor m. The exponent of the factor must be 1. But the function <coughs> um, is homogeneous of degree 1. All right. Now, if the function is homogeneous of degree 1, we can split out this function into each of its partial derivatives. Okay? So that would be the partial derivative. Let's consider the function f of k would be equal to uh, the partial derivative of I'm going to do it in words, because it's easier, and it's not a maths course. Of capital plus the partial derivative of labor. All right, lovely. Looks like lots of not looks like lots of interesting stuff. But here's here's the thing that you're overlooking. What has Wicksteed did just show? A profound, profound statement. Wicksteed has just shown in his preemptive book <clears throat> uh, The Common Sense of Political Philosophy, why a book on early methods of calculus applied to economics was called The Common Sense of Political Philosophy. Uh, in fact, that this theory uh, was was uh, later is later mentioned in it, but it's actually more on the laws of distribution, which is a pamphlet that he issued. Wixley has shown, though, that each of the composites of this function are paid its marginal. What does that mean? It means that there cannot exist a situation of exploitation if a function, if a production function like this holds, then the marginal product of labor, the amount of wage, the marginal product of labor, would be completely exhausted in the production function. In essence, Wicksteed has shown for the first time using mathematics that <clears throat> uh, everybody is paid a fair amount, every derivative is paid its fair wage, whether that wage is in interest in the form of capital or in the form of a labor wage. But we can show that this indeed holds true, and the sum of the factor products times the marginal products do exist. Storm of criticism. Criticism from Pareto, Edgeworth, and Clark. Clark, an American economist, simple footnote in our discussion, had already shown this. But Edgeworth, but Wicksteed managed to show it in a more general setting. Clark comes to his support, he says, yes, I knew about that ten years ago. Why didn't you bother reading me? Wicksteed shrugs his head, he says he didn't read you. I'm sorry, it does happen. <clears throat> Here it is. But it takes a little bit of time. It's criticized very heavily. And it's later saved by different economists who go on to show that, in fact, this does hold true. 
in that visor illustrates how, in fact, under the situation, there cannot be any exploitation. This forms the basis of one of the largest critiques that we will now run through throughout this course. You'll see this form, the Wicksteed formation is this. We'll see the Vixel problem, which will forthcoming, and it will culminate in the Cambridge capital debate. And hopefully by the end of it, you will see that indeed there are problems related to production function theory and anything on which production function theory rests. For today, that's it. <laughs>